Top Bird Talk. Thank you for inviting me to speak about frailty in the perioperative period in this joint session on frailty, fitness and function. And to set the scene right at the start, I thought I would just highlight this recently completed systematic review examining frailty prior to radical cystectomy. And this was a joint piece of work undertaken between Andrea Harron, one of the perioperative fellows from UCLH, supervised by Professor Walker, and Raj Neelal, one of the perioperative fellows working with us at the POPS team at GSTT. And what was the interesting and slightly surprising headline for us in undertaking this systematic review is that of nine studies identified which assessed frailty prior to radical cystectomy, only one of these studies actually used a recognised frailty tool. The remainder of the studies using a count of comorbidities, which was frequently badged or described as a frailty assessment tool, although it was in fact a count of comorbidities. And this kind of oversight comes about when we haven't collaborated well as professionals bringing together expertise from different fields, so involving frailty experts early, in order to both develop clinical services and of course to develop joint research agendas so that we do answer the right questions about older, frailer patients undergoing surgery using the right tools and the right expertise. So it's nice to see in the conference program that we do have a mix of people from different backgrounds and I hope that will come out in the plenary sessions. So if we um, know that frailty is not, of course, a count of um, comorbidities or multimorbidity, then how do we describe frailty? And this definition from the British Geriatric Society Fit for Frailty document from a few years ago, as you see, describes frailty as a distinctive health state related to ageing in which there is a deterioration in inbuilt reserve across different body or organ systems. And when we discuss this with patients and their families, this concept of resilience or reserve is very much described using diagrams such as this. And so we often explain to people that if I were to develop a simple, uncomplicated urinary tract infection, I may well be able to continue to go to work whilst being treated for that illness. But if an older, frailer patient developed a similar uncomplicated urinary tract infection, that can be a very significant illness. That patient may well be unable to walk or transfer as they could. They therefore go from a state of independence, as you see on the diagram here, to dependence. They may very well be hospitalised. And they may also go from cognitive independence to cognitive dependence. And as we explain to patients and their families, that isn't because there's necessarily a difference in the organism causing the urinary tract infection. But there is a definite difference in the host response to that and the host resilience in that the younger and fitter you are, the less likely you are to be knocked so significantly from such a minor external stressor that you become very dependent. And of course, the converse is true when you are old and frail, that it takes just a minor stressor to push you into a state of significant illness and dependence. And if we look at this in the perioperative setting, this diagram very much describes how it isn't often just the first insult or the first exposure to a relatively minor stressor that's the problem for the frail patient, but it's recurrent knocks which they can no longer bounce back from to regain their current level of functioning. And so you see from this diagram, it might be that that first insult or that first external stressor could be the surgical procedure. And actually the patient recovers relatively well from that. But by the time they're back to the ward and then they've developed even a relatively minor hospital acquired pneumonia or they've failed a trial without catheter or they've fallen on the ward or they've had a short episode of delirium, their resilience to bounce back to their background level is not as good as somebody who doesn't have this multi-domain frailty syndrome. So in order to better understand the frailty syndrome, we first need to remind ourselves of the original descriptions of frailty. And as you see, the first time frailty was described in the literature was 2001, when Linda Fried and colleagues described the frailty phenotype. And then a couple of years afterwards, Kenneth Rockwood and colleagues described the frailty index. And both of these original descriptions of frailty or these frailty models came from analysis of data from large North American databases. 
So to cover these in turn, the frailty phenotype described by Linda Freed essentially described five frailty defining characteristics. So you can see them on the left of the slide there. And then she described the relationship between these frailty defining characteristics and the kinds of outcomes commonly seen in frail patients. So the things that we're used to seeing on the right of the slide there. So frailer patients are more likely to fall over, be hospitalized, and ultimately have a higher mortality rate than their non-frail age match counterparts. And in the original frailty phenotype, it was described that two of these frailty defining characteristics on the left of the slide would categorize a person as pre-frail and, and having three of them would describe a patient as frail. Slightly different from the phenotype, the frailty index is a more mathematical approach which counts the number of deficits accrued across different domains and then divides this by the total possible number of deficits that somebody could have accrued. So you see here that the scale ranges or the index ranges from zero, so you've accrued no deficits and you're not frail, to one when you've got a, a full complement of deficits that are being counted. And in the original model, it was described that by the time you had about a quarter of these in a frailty index of 0.25, then you were defined as frail. And interestingly, what they found in this original research and what's been replicated similarly since is that by the time you've accrued about two thirds of the deficits that you can accrue, um, then that you can't get much frailer before death ensues fairly swiftly. So about 0.67 was sort of the highest that you could really get to on this frailty scale. And I think just to highlight um, in the definition of frailty that this is a multi-domain syndrome, you'll see that the kinds of deficits that patients accrue here are a real mixture of things. So they might be current illness, ability to manage ADL, psychological health or symptoms, psychiatric complaints, physical signs. So it's a real mixture. It isn't just a comorbidity count but a mixture of multi-domain problems that go to define this frailty syndrome. So having considered the models of frailty, it's just worth pausing here to note that there are, of course, overlapping geriatric syndromes and clinical entities relevant to frailty. And we see in the main Venn diagram that both in terms of clinical phenotypes, so the loss of muscle mass and strength, with resultant outcomes, so falling over and slowing down, but also in terms of underlying etiology, so perhaps some of the um, cytokine work going on trying to explain these syndromes, there is definitely an overlap between frailty and sarcopenia, but also an overlap with the cachexia that we see in chronic illness in older patients, so perhaps the cachexia you see with chronic heart failure. So these three are discrete clinical entities but they can quite commonly coexist and they do have an overlap in both their clinical phenotype and probably to some degree in their etiology as well. And of course, we've mentioned multimorbidity and it's very important to remember the overlap and the interaction between frailty and multimorbidity. And we know that the majority of frailer patients are also multimorbid. So about seven out of 10 is the figure that's usually cited. But far fewer multimorbid patients have frailty, so just two out of 10. And we know that from our clinical practice that patients may well have a long list of multimorbidity, but they are robust and don't appear frail when they are comprehensively assessed. So these are different clinical entities. And of course, what we know about is the survival in frailty shown by these Kaplan-Meier curves. So although you're probably familiar with these, it's always worth reminding ourselves of them. So if you're not frail, then about 90% of this older cohort would still be alive at five years. But in the severely frail group, as you see there, about a third of people only are alive at five years. And of course, frailty doesn't just impact on the clinician reported outcome of mortality, or as we've been talking about in the perioperative period of, of morbidity, 
but also very much on patient reported outcomes. So the majority of patients do not want to live life at a very dependent state. And of course, quality of life is very important. And we know that frailty also impacts on these patient reported outcomes. And then also, of course, on process measures. So not only for us in secondary care, looking at the length of stay and the number of complications and the amount of resource used during a hospital admission, but very much remembering the services used and the cost from that in the community, both from social services for more dependent, frailer patients, but also the informal cost of family members informally caring for older, frailer patients as they become more dependent. So what do we know about how much frailty this syndrome we've now described matters perioperatively? And of course, the majority of us will be familiar with this literature and unsurprisingly, frailty confers a poor prognosis on outcomes in the perioperative setting, with associations seen between 12-month mortality, postoperative complications and length of time spent in hospital after a surgical procedure. Do we see this in all settings? Well, yes, this is work looking at elective non-cardiac surgery that showed that the frailer patients undergoing these types of procedures had a higher 12-month mortality. And interestingly, even after we might consider to be fairly low-risk elective procedures. Similarly, in emergency surgery, this is a patient fairly recently from age and ageing, showing that independent of age, frailty predicts mortality after emergency surgery. And of course, also when we look at the outcomes for frailer patients requiring critical care, we know that the mortality is higher in age-matched frail patients than in their non-frail counterparts after needing critical care. So given this, what should we do? Should we assess frailty before surgery and use this as a criteria to turn the patient down for surgery? Should we assess frailty and attempt to modify the frailty syndrome and then theoretically, in so doing, modify the perioperative risk? Or should we be employing both of these approaches in that process of shared decision-making together as professionals with the patients, presenting them with the correct information, seeking their views about what's important to them and collectively coming to a management decision? And if we are to do this, can we accurately identify frailty? And of course, the tool with which you are trying to identify frailty will very much depend on the situation in which you're working. So is this as part of a research study where you may want to do something more complex and have more time? Is this in a patient who is admitted as an emergency, perhaps they need a neck of femur, fracture repairing, or perhaps they need an emergency laparotomy? Or is it if you are seeing patients electively prior to elective surgery in the outpatient setting? All of these approaches will, of course, need different tools. So it's no surprise that there's such a huge number of frailty tools in the literature. And this systematic review is about 10 years old now. And since it's been published, there have been numerous other tools described and um, published in the literature trying to define or describe the frailty syndrome. And of course, one of the reasons we have so many tools is that tools often do have different aims. So are we looking at a single surrogate measure, which aims to very simply describe whether a patient's frail, with the acknowledgement that that will never be a multi-domain assessment, so things like gait speed or grip strength? Are we looking to screen a large number of patients in order to then flag up those patients who may need a different tool or a different approach to their assessment, so something like the clinical frail scale? Or are we looking at scales for other reasons in order to try and highlight aspects of frailty that we can then optimise? And of course, as that last systematic review showed, and as we're aware in clinical practice, the majority of these tools have not been appraised for their clinometric properties, and many of them are not clinically feasible. And for many years now, we've been debating which tool we should be using in different services and different settings have used different tools. But I think we do now have consensus that patients in the UK, it is advised should be screened through the clinical frailty scale. And you see the pictorial scale here on this slide. And many of you will be familiar with this from your own clinical settings. 
And this tool is now endorsed for use by NELA and also through our national frailty network. So the acute frailty network and the specialised clinical frailty network have also all suggested that the CFS, this pictorial scale, should be the, the first point of screening for frailty. And patients who are screening at five or above should then be flagged to more geriatric medicine focused services in order that they can have a comprehensive geriatric assessment, which is the gold standard for appraising and then optimising frailty. And although we now have a consensus on this through these national organisations, it is important to mention the EFI. And many of you will be aware um, of this score, but for those who aren't aware of it, this is described by Andy Clegg and colleagues from Bradford. And this index was derived from anonymised data routinely held in the majority of UK GP databases. And Clegg and team calculated a frailty score from this routinely held data um, and then examined how this score worked in terms of outcomes, very much as Kenneth Rockwood had with the original description of the frailty index from a research database and found that it mapped very similarly to Rockwood's original description. Therefore, concluding that from a routinely held data set, so all the information on the GP computer systems, we can actually generate a frailty index without needing to collect extra variables. And so those of you who work in areas where this EFI has been commissioned will see that your patients are now being admitted with, an, with a frailty score, that score from 0 to 1, as we looked at originally, on their GP printout when they um, attend the hospital for whatever reason. And the EFI very much can be used to kind of screen and direct services. So um, GP, GP services are looking at this and saying, well, this patient is pre-frail, so they should be then undergoing interventions to try and reverse or prevent the process into frailty. And then for the, the frailer group who do need a comprehensive geriatric assessment, proactively sending them up to CGA clinics um, in the locality. And the point of identifying frailty is to see if we can then modify it. Broadly speaking, the literature in this area divides up into exercise, nutrition and pharmacological interventions. So we'll just look at the literature on this in turn now. Um, and this is a really nice systematic review um, published recently, which actually focuses on frailty modifiers in the primary care setting. And although we are, of course, as a group, predominantly hospital based, I think the majority of us would agree that we would far rather see our patients attending either our preoperative outpatient clinics or attending as emergency surgical presentations with a kind of backstory of having been worked up or prehabilitated way before the presentation of that acute surgical pathology. So although this may not map exactly onto our own practice, actually, I think that push back to primary care is really important and we can learn from this primary care literature. And what we see in this systematic review is that it's a combination of muscle strength training and protein supplementation that was most effective in either delaying the progression to worsening frailty or indeed reversing frailty. And this combination was also fairly feasible to implement in the primary care setting, as you see from that diagram on the right of the slide. And we've also got other papers looking at this, including hospital level, hospital setting data, as you see here from this recent paper from Finbar Martin et al in the Lancet. And I think although we do have some consensus on exercise and protein supplementation being probably the best intervention for frailty at the moment, we need to very much acknowledge, as you see here, that the quality of the evidence that was in that went into these meta-analyses was fairly low. So we do need better quality studies examining this. And it's always worth reminding ourselves when we're thinking about nutrition and frailty, that of course we know that losing weight is one of those frailty defining criteria. But with the issues we have in the population with obesity, this U or J shaped curve is important to remember. And we know that frailty and body mass index follow this curve with worse outcomes and higher levels of frailty in both the very underweight, but also in the obese group. So it's important remembering that although we may want to look at protein supplementation, this may also need to be done as part of a weight controlling regime.
And in terms of pharmacological therapies, there have been several trials looking at different drug treatments. To date, there's been no benefit in many of these. But interestingly, based on the literature from cardiac failure and cardiac cachexia, where it was noted that patients on ACE inhibitors possibly had an improved exercise capacity and less frailty defining illnesses, so a, a potential less number of fewer falls and less postural instability. The LACE study looking at leucine supplementation and ACE inhibitors has completed recruitment, but unfortunately has been delayed by the COVID pandemic, but hopes to report at the end of 2020. So um, it's a potential pharmacological modifier of, of sarcopenia and therefore potentially frailty and um, that it's worth looking out for. But looking at these single interventions, I think we need to remind ourselves of what frailty is. And we described at the start of this session how frailty is a multi-domain um, syndrome. And of course, whenever we're talking about multi-domain problems, we often need a complex or multi-component intervention with which to tackle that. And we often, as the MRC has described, when we're thinking about these complex interventions, do need multidisciplinary assessments of multi-domain problems in order to use the evidence base we have, but tailored to that complex patient in order to achieve the right outcomes. And to us as geriatricians, this sounds very much like comprehensive geriatric assessment and optimization, which is the underpinning methodology behind where geriatricians practice, whether that's at the front door in ED, or whether it's in the community, or whether that's on medical wards within the hospital setting. And of course, we do have an evidence base for comprehensive geriatric assessment in different settings. You see here that this is LS's review from 2012, Cochrane Review, showing that patients who underwent comprehensive geriatric assessment in the medical inpatient wards under geriatricians were more likely to be alive and living in their own homes up to 18 months after undergoing that process of optimization. We see from Rachel Cadaru's paper, again, a Cochrane review looking at CGA in a predominantly hip fracture population, but with one cancer study included, that there was an impact on mortality when orthogeriatricians were involved in the care and patients underwent CGA, and that this was also likely to be cost effective. And then this is a small randomised control trial that we've undertaken locally at Guy's and St Thomas's, looking at the process of CGA in frailer, older vascular patients. And if we can't, what do we need to do in terms of shared decision making with those patients to make sure that people are getting the right care? So when we think about frailty in the peroperative period and that sort of brief look at the literature, where, where has this left us? And, and what I think we really don't need um, is more frailty screening tools. We have consensus about the screening tool to use and we have comprehensive geriatric assessment which can be employed when patients appear to be at risk. We don't need numerous studies telling us that frailty is bad for us. I think we can see that from the literature we have. But what we really do need is better quality clinical studies examining the impact of interventions on the frail patient, particularly in the perioperative setting, in order to be able to better tailor the services we are providing at the moment in an evidence-based way. And then we very much need to remember, as we said at the start, that frailty doesn't occur in isolation. And of course, we do then need to involve all expertise in a collaborative way, using a whole system approach to try and get the best outcomes for this complex, frailer surgical group. Thank you. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EDPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. If you check out edpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home. Check out edpom.org now.